Well, what we're going to take a look at today is the real life world of pediatric trauma. And the way we're actually going to do that, based on past experience, you know that there's only two different ways that people can lecture. The first way is the way that most of y'all have experienced in your careers, and it's nicely described as downright awful. What that utilizes, as you know, is a whole lot of statistics and charts and graphs and all those other things that people throw up on the screen, not that you'd actually want to read them at 9 o'clock in the morning on your day off. And as these people speak to you in a monotone voice, you know that after about 15 seconds, your head starts bobbing. You know, after about 30 seconds, your head starts bobbing to the point that you start wishing you had a stiff neck collar you could wrap around your neck to keep your head from bobbing. And within about a minute, you start putting your beeper on the desk and praying to the almighty page or God that you can be rescued. <laughs> that is a long day. Therefore, there has to be a better way, and there actually is. And that's to think about the two things we do incredibly well. Well, number one, we take care of our patients. Never been an issue. Number two is simply this, especially if there's any sort of beer involved. Because what happens if I take eight of you all, take you out on a Saturday night, put you at a wedding with two pitchers of beer? How long does it take us to get past the socialities about the husband, the wife, and the kids and start telling downright gross and disgusting stories? You know this. It's actually been scientifically studied to be 32 seconds before we start telling these stories. And we, of course, do not consider there to be a single problem with this. The problem is called your husband or your wife who happens not to be medically trained. And as they come over to your table and start to listen to your stories, how long does it take them to say this? <laughs> you see, you guys are sick. And what do we tell them? You're absolutely right. Now step away from the table, let me get back to my story. That's the way that we're going to lecture today. So first, let's start off with Annette. Because Annette was only two years old when her parents purchased a new Doberman. They went out to dinner for the first time since purchasing the animal and left it into the care of their 13-year-old babysitter. When they returned home, they found the babysitter in the basement on the phone with her boyfriend. They found Annette in the back foyer in the jaws of her Doberman being shaken back and forth by her head. As you can see, Annette is as sick as they come. She's intubated, sedated, chemically paralyzed. She's already been to the OR to move epidural and subdural bleeds. If you look at the left side of her chest, she's got a chest tube in because one of the teeth punctured through the chest wall, giving her a collapsed lung with air and with blood. Now, as most of y'all know from past experience, if you give these injuries to a big person, how are they going to do? Yeah, so-so. But across the board, you're exactly right. Big people just don't do very well. However, what y'all know about kids is very different, right? And that's when kids crash, they do it right. And we will talk about that later and very appropriately so, and that freaks us out and very appropriately so. However, the best part about taking care of sick kids is that above and beyond all else, if you give them a chance, they do get better. And they get better at a seemingly unbelievable rate. Case in point, Annette at extubation, right before discharge, and when she comes back to visit. That really is the best part about taking care of sick kids, is that as we'll keep coming back to above and up again, it's best described as if you get them when they're doing something, they'll be discharged doing something. Therefore, we first need to take a look at this idea. Because if somebody asks you why do kids code, what's the answer? It's respiratory, right? If it's not respiratory, it's probably what? No, it's probably respiratory. And that's what you want to come away with. <laughs> Is that above and beyond all else, it's respiratory first. Can it be cardiac first? Absolutely. For those sticking around this afternoon later, yes, it can happen. However, it is exceedingly rare. In the vast majority of cases, it's respiratory first, and that's why later on down the road, their heart actually stops. So with that, you know that there's only two ways to give oxygen to children. And that's called tube them or don't tube them. Well, children, just like big people, are much happier when they're not intubated. Therefore, ways to give oxygen to children without intubating them. Number one, do absolutely nothing at all. Why? Is this little one sick or not sick? Not sick. Good. Why? Smiling. Sitting up, smiling, pink, warm, dry, very little known medical sign called the positive sitting up and chewing on the pulse ox cord sign. <laughs> that is incredibly diagnostic. Your kid is not doing that bad. Number two, never underestimate the power of a well-placed binky. <laughs> Binkies are your friends. They will turn seemingly demonically possessed children into happy kids just by a well-placed binky. 
Now, this is not for amateurs. This is a very advanced technique called blow by plus binky. It works very well, you know, nice non-threatening manner. You do give a whole lot of supplemental oxygen to a kid. However, one of the very underutilized devices in kids is cannulas. Cannulas are fabulous in kids for a couple reasons. Number one, for those who take care of big people, do big people like wearing masks? <coughs> nah, they hate it. For those who work especially in respiratory, last time you tried to put an adult on CPAP or BiPAP. What's the next thing they do? Pull it off. Good. How do you keep it on? <laughs> yes, yeah, suture, staple, duct tape. Otherwise, rest assured, that puppy's coming off. Well, kids are the same way. They hate having things strapped to their face. Well, take that one step further. Remember, up until six months, kids are what they call preferential nose breathers. It's a big, fancy medical term for they like to breathe through their nose. They're not smart enough to say when they've got RSV that both sides of their nose are clogged up with goobers. Therefore, I'll breathe through that wide open, patent, gaping hole, otherwise known as my mouth. And I'm sure you all have seen this. They come in, in profound respiratory distress trying to suck air in and out of their clogged up nose. Well, you know what? If they breathe through their nose and they hate having things strapped to their face, it makes sense to give them oxygen nose. Now, how do you do it? It's 2 o'clock in the morning. You're working in the ER. You're supposed to have a pediatric nasal cannula, but the only thing you can find on the cart is an adult nasal cannula, and you need to use it on a two-year-old. What do you do? Good. You wing it. Take the tips. Cut them halfway off. You now have a pediatric nasal cannula. <laughs> if you take the tips, you cut them completely off. You now have an infant nasal cannula. <laughs> this is not for long-term use, but until you can get the right stuff up, you know what? It works. More important than that, though, is called how fast you run it. Because especially when you're stressed, you go back to what you know. And if what you primarily know is big people, this is a problem. And the reason being is, think about it, how fast do you run a nasal cannula in an adult? What? Two, four, six, right? RTs will teach you you don't run more than six liters for two reasons. Number one, it hurts. Number two, it's running too fast to get added humidification as it actually flows on downstream. Now, children are much smaller creatures. Therefore, if it looks like a kid, it acts like a kid, a liter or two up their nose, the kid's going to do great. I can think of incredibly few children I've ever taken care of who require more than a liter or two up their nose. Now, why that's a problem is this. A couple years back, when I was working up in the adult medical ICU, they brought us down from the floor a 75-year-old COPD, and y'all have seen him, sitting bolt up on the bed, turning purple, can't breathe. Got his oxygen to go to two liters by minute, though, because they didn't want him to stop breathing. <laughs> So I asked the nurse, I said, do me a favor and turn the oxygen up a little bit. And they turned it up from two liters by nasal cannula to what? Three. Even better than three. Five. Five? Even better than five? <laughs> ten? Even better than ten? Oh, Fifteen. <laughs> <laughs> now, what very little known medical sign do you get when you're ready nasal cannula at 15 liters a minute? That is called the positive space shuttle sign when your nasal cannula <laughs> starts to hover somewhere outside your nose. Quick reminder, folks, if you cannot keep the oxygen in their nose, that's a clue <laughs> that perhaps you need to turn it down just a touch, and it really does work. Again, if it looks like a kid, it acts like a kid. Lead or two up their nose, they really should do pretty well. Now, what about this child? Sick or not sick? Sick. Good. Why? He looks sick. Number two, he's not fighting the mask, and that in itself is a very diagnostic sign. The way that I personally feel it works in real life is simple. If you have a kid who lets you put a mask on their face, they probably ought to have a mask on their face. If you can have a kid who can actively fight to put that mask on or off their face, you know what? They probably don't need to have the mask put on their face. Now, children just like big people, only two ways. Tube them, don't tube them. Just like your adult counterparts, the way you give the most without intubation is a non-rebreather. And as long as you've got enough oxygen so the bag is inflated, and the mask is actually on the child's face and not on their forehead, you can give them pretty darn close to 100%. However, if you look at children, they have a medical phenomenon called big head, little body syndrome. And as we'll show you throughout today, big head, little body syndrome is incredibly important to remember. And as we'll show you, the magic number in kids is six. Up until age six, kids are still kids. They look like kids, they act like kids, they're still cute little kids. After age six, say what you will, they're big people. They start looking like big people, they start acting like big people, they get attitudes like big people, but up until age six, pretty much, they're still cute little kids. Which means, if you take a perfectly healthy two-year-old, 
sedate the heck out of them for an hour-long MRI, put them flat on their back in a papoose board, what does that potentially do to their airway? Closes it off, exactly. It shoves their chin down to their chest. They don't breathe very well. How do we know that's an issue? Think about the last time you all recertified in basic CPR. After you said, Annie, Annie, you okay? What's the next thing you do? Open the airway, right? Not Annie, Annie, you okay? I'm going to kill you now. <laughs> Your chances of getting recertified are probably pretty grim. <laughs> Therefore, you need to do something to offset big old head little bodies. So when babies put a diaper behind their shoulders, and bigger kids a rolled up towel behind their shoulders, either way, just a little something to offset big old head little body, you're ready to go. Works very well for medicine. What about trauma? What about a two-year-old that falls out of a four-story window and lands on his head? Well, everybody's got a broken neck and two proven differently, right? This will show you when we come back from break that's actually not true anymore. But in this case, it's very appropriate. The reason being, number one, he's two. Number two, he's unconscious. And number three, even if he's fully conscious, he's two. And he's not going to tell you his neck hurts. But what happens if you lay this kid flat on a spine board, what does that do to his cervical spine? Yeah, it throws it into flexion. If you shoot an x-ray, it actually looks like a U, and that defeats the purpose of putting this kid in a board. Therefore, even in trauma, where you know you don't want anything on their board but their butt, you have to put a little something behind their shoulders. Now, how is this getting easier? Have you all seen the new pediatric spine boards? These are slowly disseminating into the ER and EMS world. And what's nice about the PEDS boards is a couple things. Number one, they're half the size of a big person board. Therefore, the only thing you can put on it is a kid. Number two, most importantly, look right here. It's got an area that's recessed into the board that automatically offsets big old head little body syndrome. It's one less thing for you to have to remember at 2 o'clock in the morning.